I think it's fair to say that never in the process uh, have we seen a more contentious debate over nominees, and you don't have to be an insider to see that. One of the benchmarks would be something called cloture votes, and I'll explain it just briefly this way and get into more detail later. Any senator can object almost any time to anything. It is the ultimate in minority rights. And when an objection to proceed to a matter or proceed to a, a vote is made, the only way that you can proceed is either through negotiating some kind of an agreement or to overcoming the objection by the filing of a cloture petition, which requires, I've forgotten, 14 or 16 signatures, and then a day and a half later you have a vote. And ordinarily, a cloture vote requires 60 votes to pass. And that's where the 60 vote requirement for judges and everything else comes from. So if you consider the number of cloture petitions and cloture votes that have been required, you have a pretty good idea of how contentious nominations were. And here's an interesting statistic. Actually, Steve Quist found this for me. In the first two years of the terms of President Carter, Reagan, and George H.W. Bush, there was not a single cloture vote on a single nomination. That means that there was no objection by any senator to proceeding to a majority vote on the nominee. And I'll tell you a story. During the Clarence Thomas uh, confirmation debate on the floor of the Senate, both Senator Kennedy and Senator Leahy, both senior members of the Judiciary Committee, made the point that they didn't want to see Clarence Thomas confirmed, and they knew they could stop him if they required a cloture vote that required 60 senators. But they said that would be wrong. That's never been done in history. Even though there's no rule, the comity, the tradition of the Senate, has been to allow a majority vote. And therefore, they would allow a majority vote. And of course, they didn't like Clarence Thomas, but they were willing to abide by the losing result. They were on the losing side, 52 to 48. So that's how important the notion of a pure majority, 51 votes, was as recently as the Clarence Thomas nomination. But after George Bush became president, things began to change. You go uh, just before that, during Clinton's first two years, there actually were eight such votes, so you began to see this. And then there were four in the first two years of President George Bush. These are uh, cloture votes on judicial nominations by these presidents in their first two years. For President Obama, there were 12. For President Trump, in his first two years, there have already been 128 cloture votes. So that's how much the Democratic minority has objected to the consideration of a Trump nominee. It's a pretty fair measure of how contentious the, the uh, system has become. And as I'll discuss in a moment, there are growing calls for a change in these rules. At the end, uh, toward the end of the Obama administration, he became frustrated that Republicans were slowing down his nominees too much. And while Harry Reid still had the majority, he decided to change that by changing the rules for district court nominees and circuit court nominees from a 60 vote potential cloture requirement to a mere 51, a majority. He couldn't get two-thirds of the senators to agree to a rule change, so he resorted to something called the nuclear option. And I only go into this detail because there's a bunch of lawyers here. I think you enjoy this, this kind of minutia as much as I do. <laughs> so you don't have a two-thirds vote. How do you change the rules? Well, you do something that is very dangerous. It's, it's like being the first one to throw a nuclear weapon out because you know it's going to come back at you. What you do is you ask the parliamentarian uh, parliamentary inquiry, uh, how many votes does it, uh, does it take now to, uh, uh, to confirm uh, this district judge? Parliamentarian whispers the answer to the presiding officer who says, well, 
If the cloture petition is, uh, if cloture is invoked, it's 60 votes. I appeal the ruling of the chair. All right, non-debatable, majority vote. So Reed's got the majority of the Democrats there. The chair's ruling is appealed, and voila, the 60 vote to prevail on cloture evaporates, and it's now 51. That's the nuclear option. And so that's the way it was for district court nominees and circuit court nominees when President Trump took office. It thus became easier for Leader McConnell to help confirm President Trump's nominees, but for the time requirement. Even though the number of votes changed, the ruling of the chair did not change the post-cloture rules. And one of the post-cloture rules is that after cloture has been invoked, you've got 30 hours of debate. And so you can do the math. The biggest problem that any majority leader has is time for doing things on the floor. And so this still presents a problem. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. But this is the lay of the land when President Trump takes office. With this being the fact, if all Republicans stick together and the leader can get the judge's name before the full body, the nominee's name, the Senate can confirm and with only Republican votes if they stick together. And so far, I think with only one exception on the circuit court uh, nominee, they have stuck together. So that's the situation as we see it. Now, the Trump nominees have been a little different than uh, some of the past nominees. First of all, they tend to be younger. The idea there from Don McGahn, uh, the White House counsel who advised the President a lot of this was, we need to get some younger conservative people who are going to be there for a while on the bench. And they tend to be very well credentialed and less political in the sense that these are not people who have been elected to public office or have held uh, local judgeships. Again, they tend to be younger and coming really uh, straight out of the law practice in most cases. And the administration has put a premium on sound judicial methodology. Are the uh, nominees textualists or originalists, as understood by Anton Scalia, for example? And especially in the appeals courts, they focused a lot on that. So this has required the Democrats in opposition to resort to three particular tactics to try to de defeat the nominees. The first is to peel off Republicans by alleging either excessive social conservatism or racial insensitivity. And that's been done with several nominees to date, and in one case with Ryan Bounds, it was successful on the racial insensitivity charge, an unfair charge. By the way, the most recent nominee to be confirmed to the D.C. Court of Appeals, Naomi Rao, was also uh, pretty viciously attacked. Uh, for her social views, and she was confirmed by a pure party-line vote just this last week. So the first thing is to try to peel off some Republicans, and with only a 53 to 47 uh, majority, um, you only have to have to peel off a few. The second is to withhold blue slips. And we're going to talk some more about blue slips. And the third is to consume as much time as possible, and I already alluded to that, so we'll get to that in just a second. But back to the uh, peeling off of votes, maybe if you're following this, you've seen the incredible attention, almost uh, obscene attention now to what these nominees have written in college. Uh, and I confess to have written some rather odd things in college, and I suspect <laughs> a lot of people have. And so this is the first place where they go to find something that absolutely demonstrates how incredibly unqualified this particular nominee is. And there are also some very sophisticated efforts to try to trap nominees to talk about social issues in the context of what they believe and how they would rule. And of course, you never want to fall into those traps. Uh, so the hearings become very combated. And also, the role of outside groups have, have, has really uh, blossomed now. And I have a little bit of a bone to pick with people who, who identify groups as outside groups. Outside simply means they're outside of the beltway. They're still Americans, and every American has a right to petition his or her government, remember, and to join together to do that. So if you want to join some crazy organization uh, and spend a lot of money on political advertising to try to defeat a nominee, that's your right. Uh, but, but 
you ought to do it in a fairly sensible way and in a way that it has some civility attached to it, at least in my view. So unseemly techniques have given these outside groups a bad name in my view. In any event, that's, that's the first technique. The second technique is blue slips. A blue slip is simply a blue piece of paper that the chairman of the Judiciary Committee sends to you when somebody from your state has been nominated and the question is, are you ready to have a hearing on your state's nominee yet? And if you sign the blue slip and say yes, then your nominee can get a hearing. And if you don't get a hearing, you're stopped. You don't get to have your name put forth uh, to the Judiciary Committee, and then you don't get passed out of the Judiciary Committee to the floor, where, of course, you could be confirmed. So you've got to have a hearing. And one technique of slowing things down or stopping it all together is to simply not send in your blue strip slip. So if you're a Democrat, let's say, and President Trump nominates someone who you think is too conservative, you simply sit on your blue slip. And for district court nominees, uh, that works perfectly well. But think about this. For a circuit court nominee, let's say that this is a nominee to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals from Arizona. And uh, Senator Kamala Harris doesn't doesn't think that that conservative from Arizona ought to go in the Ninth Circuit. Should she have a blue slip opportunity, or should it only be the two senators from Arizona? Oh, wait, one of the senators from Arizona is a Democrat, too. So how should that work for a circuit where it's not just your state, but an entire region of the country? Well, first, some statistics, and then I'll tell you how it's worked out. Of President Trump's first 31 circuit judges, 14 came from states with at least one Democrat. And of the remaining 11, I now think it's down to 10, nine come from states with at least one Democrat. So senators in Minnesota, California, New York, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Washington, New Jersey, and Oregon have all refused to turn in their blue slips on ideological grounds, and that would account for almost one-fourth of Trump's circuit court nominees prevented from getting hearings. Only two Judiciary Committee chairmen in the past have held uh, to this view, that a failure to be, turn a blue slip is an absolute veto. One was Chairman Eastland, who was fighting to preserve segregation, and the other was Chairman Leahy, who went so far as to give the two Michigan Democrat senators cross-slip veto powers over judges nominated to the Sixth Circuit, even though from other states. Well, that's not fair, obviously. And so to overcome this obstruction with regard to circuit courts, Chairman Grassley and now Chairman Graham have both taken the position that the blue slip does represent a veto for district judges because they're within your state, but not for circuit court. It's only a matter of consultation for circuit court nominees. And that has enabled um, several circuit court nominees to proceed, notwithstanding objection from senators. Senators um, from Wisconsin, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, and Washington all failed to turn in blue slips, but uh, their nominees proceeded because of the position of the chairman of the Judiciary Committee. So you can see that this is, this is still a way to slow down or stop a nominee for district court. If you can't negotiate it out, uh, the chairman is going to recognize your veto, and the president's got to go back all over again, get another nominee, and of course these nominees generally come from the Senate delegation, and then they've got to be vetted through the vetting process of the FBI and all. It takes a long time. So it's a good way to keep things balled up uh, for a long time. And again, this is not a rule of the Senate or the Judiciary Committee. This is simply a matter of comity. Oh, you've uh, refused to turn the blue slip for a judge from your state, I'll recognize that because I, I respect your position as a senator from that state. That's common to uh, Interestingly, I mentioned the Ninth Circuit. California traditionally holds a majority of the positions of the 29 judges authorized for the Ninth Circuit. So the California uh, senators, if the old rule had been applied or old tradition had been applied, could basically have a veto of a majority of the Ninth Circuit judges. But again, that's been changed. Third thing, floor time. As I said, the majority leader is always fighting time. There's never enough time to do anything. And if you've got to get a bunch of executive branch nominees, and there are well over a thousand of these for any administration, probably about almost 1,300, 
plus all of the judicial uh, vacancies that have nominees, you could be doing nothing but uh, confirmation, you not have time for any legislative activity. So in the old, the way it used to be uh, is that the leader would bundle several judges together at a time and just ask for unanimous consent. They're not controversial. Well-qualified people, and he'd try to put a couple people in who Democrats supported as well as a couple who Republicans supported, and put about five in a UC order and ask unanimous consent that the following five people be uh, confirmed by acclamation. Is there objection? Hearing none, they're confirmed. And I used to call those candidates today, I've got good news and bad news. The bad news is you didn't get a big overwhelming vote, but the good news is you didn't need one. It was all done by voice vote. But, uh, but that doesn't happen anymore. What happens now is that the minority uh, invokes the objection, which requires the filing of a cloture petition, which requires a vote to grant the petition, and then after that vote is held, 30 hours of debate are permitted on the nominee. And if you do the math, this basically, uh, when, you, when you do the stuff before the vote and after the vote, you're talking about a full week. And by the way, the first votes usually occur at 5.30 on Monday night, and everybody wants to get out of town by about 2.30 on Thursday afternoon. So even if you keep the senators in longer, it, you're only going to get one a week. The math doesn't work out. You can't people the courts with that kind of a situation. So uh, there has been an effort to try to do something about that. And as a result, uh, a, the Rules Committee in the Senate has proposed that the debate time for district court judges would be reduced to two hours, as well as non-cabinet officer executive branch nominees. This would save a lot of time. And of course, it will not pass because the Democrats will oppose it. Uh, Mitch, I, I talked to Senator McConnell last week. He said he still needs to have the vote in order to show everybody that we don't have the votes. And so that vote will probably uh, take place after the week of recess right now, perhaps in about two weeks. When it fails, he then, McConnell then, has the option of the, of the same nuclear option as before, asking a ruling of, of the chair, uh, does it really, does the rule really require 30 hours of debate after cloture petition uh, is, is adopted? The chair rules that it does. Well, I appeal a ruling of the chair. And then the majority of Republicans, knowing that the Democrats haven't supported the rule change, will do the nuclear option and say, okay, it's now two hours. That's the new precedent. Maybe that'll happen. If it does, at least it's a way to get around another one of the roadblocks to getting the judges confirmed. And um, when you look at the numbers, uh, it, it is pretty daunting. Uh, these are not totally accurate, but they're pretty close. There are about 150 pending nominations for the executive branch, and about 60 pending Article III judges. And that's not even including the bankruptcy, the Court of Claims, and the Military Court of Appeals judges. So, and, and I can break that down further. On the Article III breakdown, after uh, Naomi Rao's confirmation, there are nine circuit court vacancies with six nominees pending, and 129 district court vacancies, 54 nominees pending. So you can see that there are still a lot of nominations that haven't yet gotten to the Senate. Uh, either the person hasn't been selected, or the vetting is not complete, or the name hasn't been set up. So there's a lot of work to be done there. So those are some of the reasons why, when you, when you read about this, you hear that it's taking so long. And that, by the way, the same thing applies to U.S. attorney nominees. So you've now got the inside scoop on the confirmation process and where it stands right now with potential rule changes in another week. Uh, what about the Kavanaugh nomination? I'm not going to relitigate that. I'll let uh, Rachel Mitchell, who's here tonight, uh, uh, provide that report. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I, I'm not going to say a lot about it, but if you do have a question about it, I'm, I'm happy to try to answer it. But I will say this. I helped to sure Judge Kavanaugh. He's a delightful guy. Uh, he uh, is everything that everyone said he was through his first hearing. Senator McCain passed away. I get appointed to serve in his stead. I go back to Washington, and it's like parachuting into a war zone. Professor Ford has now made her allegations. I couldn't even get from my office to the Capitol 
the people were clogging the hallways of the office building in the Capitol and shoving microphones in your face and beating with signs, spitting all over Lindsey Graham. They didn't spit on me, but you saw the stuff about uh, Senator Flake and all. It was, it was a very distressing time in Washington, and then you saw the hearing, and uh, I, I don't think hardly anybody comported themselves very well in that whole process. And so uh, I'll just conclude with, with the question, really, of whether there's a way around this, and if you do want to beat this dead horse further in questions, as I said, we can do that. But, but the real question is, uh, okay, Kavanaugh is done, but what about the next one? Is there a way the Senate can pull back from the brink here? And my simple and unfortunate answer is, not until this country makes a big turn from turning so much important political stuff over to the courts. As long as major public policy decisions are going to be made by the courts, the nominees to the court are going to be big deals, and the confirmation process is going to be a really big deal, and politicians and outside groups and everybody else is going to fight about it. And that's probably the way it ought to be. So the real answer is executive branch, legislative branch in, in particular, take back some of your authority and stop letting judges decide everything. That'll turn down the temperature and probably take care of the problem. There, there are other reforms that have been suggested, if you want to refer to them as reforms. One is to increase the number of judges on the court and unpack it after a Democratic president and Senate has been elected. Another is to put term limits on the judges or a, a retirement age, mandatory retirement age, makes it a little, little less important than who you put in there because they're not going to be there for quite as long, at least that's the theory. And, and obviously, to the question of how you deal with the civility, I don't know that the framers um, ever had in mind that it was going to be this uncivil, probably because they didn't think the courts were going to be that important. But when I, So if you have a good reform idea, I'd love to hear it, but I, I'm always reminded of the novel where the, the woman is sitting there knitting and uh, the, the questioner has, has posed the question to her and her answer is reform? Sir, don't talk of reform. Things are bad enough already. <laughs> Once again, thank you for the privilege of being here, and I'm happy to try to answer your questions.